work. Can't live without it, but sometimes you feel like you can't live with it. Maybe you're discontent in your job. You don't know what God is calling you to do, or you just don't know how to honor God and find true and deep fulfillment in your job. Whether you're a stay-at-home mom, a publicist, a podcaster, we all as Christians are trying to figure out how to work well in a way that glorifies God. Jordan Rayner, author of the books Called to Create and The Word Before Work, is an expert on this subject. He has an incredible, refreshing perspective on the theology of work and how we actually apply it to our lives, apply it to our work for the good of others, ourselves, and for the glory of God. Wow. I was so encouraged by this conversation. I know this is going to be a popular episode. Listen to it multiple times. Share it with your friends. This is a great one for the new year. Without further ado, here's our new friend, Jordan Rayner. Jordan, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Uh, For those who may not know, can you tell us who you are and what you do? Yeah. So, hey, Allie, it's great to be with you. My name is Jordan Raynor. I live in Tampa, Florida, and my mission in life is to help Christians connect their faith with the work that they do 40, 50 hours a week, whether that's as an entrepreneur, a barista, an accountant, a stay-at-home parent, whatever that work is, because when we read the scriptures, it's clear that work is of great importance, both now and for eternity to the God of the Bible. And what inspired you to start writing about this? I mean, work has been a fact of life for all of human existence. And so you decided to kind of approach it, though, in a new way. Why'd you do that? Yes, this is really rooted in my personal story. So before I was creating content like this full time, I spent 10 years as a tech entrepreneur. And about halfway through that journey, uh, I was in the process of selling my second company trying to figure out what I was going to do next with my life. And when you sell two companies, like the natural thing is you go, you know, you start a third, right? Uh, So that was the plan. But for a hot minute there, my wife and I were very seriously considering planning a church because, and I think a lot of our listeners will resonate with this. Yeah, I I was just overcome with guilt. How dare I want to go start another business when there is a need for people to move to into mud huts 5,000 miles away from right. home to make disciples and plant churches. And so we were really seriously considering planning a church for a little bit. And by the grace of God alone, I had this godly mentor pull me aside after church one Sunday. He's like, hey, uh, I hear you're thinking about planting a church. And I'm like, yeah. And I'm thinking this guy's going to like pat me on the back, maybe write me my first check. And I'll never forget. He just looked me like square in the eyes. He's like, Jordan, yeah, that just sounds like really dumb for you, for you personally. <laughs> He's like, Jordan, you're a talented entrepreneur. You have served your investors and your teams through the ministry of excellence. Why do you think you have to go plant a church in order to do ministry? Don't you get that your work is ministry? Yeah. I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And so he told me, he's like, hey, listen, in light of this conversation, go back to your Bible, read Genesis one and two that you probably read a hundred times in light of this conversation and tell me what you find. And what I found changed my life forever. I I found that before God tells us that he is loving or holy or omnipotent, he tells us that he is a God who works, created as the first verb in the Bible and pretty much the only thing we know about God through this first couple of chapters of Genesis. And then I saw that long before the great commission comes onto the scene where Jesus tells us to make disciples of all nations, right there in Genesis 1 is the first commission to humankind to fill the earth, to subdue it, to rule it in line with God's character and his law. And that transformed my perspective about work. Work is not uh, a means to an end. Work is not the curse of sin. Hmm. Work is God's first gift to humanity. Hmm. Uh, And it's the only gift that never really ends because we're going to be working forever uh, in eternity with Jesus by our side. So oh, that, that message changed my life. I was that. like, I got to go all in on this. Yes. I remember hearing a few years ago, um, the truth that work is not a result of the fall, but as you said, it, it 
predates the fall that Adam was placed in the garden to what? To sit there and enjoy the fruit? No, to work and to keep it. And so that was before sin entered the world. So that does disrupt kind of our idea of work being a necessary evil, just something that you do to get to Friday. So how does that tangibly change then how we work as an accountant, as a barista, as a stay-at-home mom? Because, I mean, a lot of people feel like their work is just kind of purposeless outside of making themselves and maybe making their boss money. Maybe they don't like it. Maybe it's really mundane. But how does that reality that work predates the fall, that it's not a necessary evil, how does that tangibly change how we work on a day-to-day basis? Yeah, it's a great question. So number one, I think it helps us look for the inherent goodness of our work, right? As you pointed out, Ali, paradise, contrary to what we think about the Garden of Eden, paradise wasn't a vacation. It was a vocation that Mm. human beings had, Mm. right? Uh, And so that allows us to see, okay, yes, my work is difficult today because we live on the other side of Genesis 3, but there's something inherently good about this thing because this is the very thing that God made me to do in this world. Right. So that's number one. Number two, I think practically, I think we can lament over what's hard about our work, what's difficult about our work. Right. And just cry out to God. You know, we forget the Exodus, the second book of the Bible. The whole impetus for the Exodus was slavish labor. Mm. Was was people crying out to God and saying, Hey, this work is too hard. And he came and saved the people. So I think we can lament over the hard things about our work. And then third, we can look forward expectantly to the day in which work will be perfect once again. And I think we can get glimpses of that now, but we're not going to see it in full until Jesus brings heaven to earth where heaven will ultimately be. And man, we have such distorted theology uh, around heaven. We think of it as this glorified retirement home in the clouds. That is an Mm. unbiblical lie from the pit of hell that steals our hope and anticipation for the future. Isaiah 65 says, God's chosen people will long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain. On the new earth, we will have good, perfect work to do. And if that doesn't fuel your hope and anticipation for eternity, man, I don't know what does. That gets me fired up. All right, quick pause to tell you about our first sponsor for the day, and that is Dwell. Dwell is a Bible app where you can both read and listen to God's Word. I love it because I don't always have time as a mom, as a busy person, to sit down for an hour every morning and soak in the Psalms with my commentary and my original Greek and Hebrew Bible next to me, but I still want to make sure that I am hiding God's Word in my heart. And so a really great way to do that is to listen. Now, you can listen and read or you can listen when you're on the go when you're cleaning the dishes when you're on a walk when you're in the car it's just a really great way to make sure that we are still taking in the truth of scripture even if we don't have time to sit down and do a whole systematic theology study every morning there's a great deal right now this is awesome especially if you're trying to read more of the bible this year if you go to dwellapp.io slash relatable you get 10% off a yearly subscription or 33% off Dwell for Life. That's an awesome deal. That 33% off means you save $50. So make sure to visit dwellapp.io slash relatable. Commit to scripture for this entire year or better yet the rest of your life. Dwellapp.io slash relatable. So the curse of work is not the work itself or even that it's strenuous. The curse came that you will work and sometimes produce nothing. That's exactly right. Sometimes our work will be futile. That's right. Yes. And the redeemed in the renewed world, though, that curse is reversed and we are no longer laboring in vain. So tell me about that, because, you know, we were talking about work on yesterday's episode and I almost said, you know, we are going to be working and the new heaven and the new earth, but I wasn't sure that I was exactly right. I knew that work came before the fall, but I hadn't thought about it quite enough. And then I heard you say on another podcast that that's true. So tell me, tell me about that because honestly, like I like working that, that excites me. So tell me, like, tell me the scriptural (laughs) basis for that and what that looks like. Yeah. So there's a couple of scriptures I would point you to. Number one, we already talked about Genesis one and two. Right, work ex- because work existed prior to the fall of Genesis three, 
we can know that work and not just our physical bodies and souls will be redeemed. Jesus came to make all things new, not just human beings. He came to win back everything Satan stole in Genesis 3. So if Jesus' victory is going to be total and complete, we believe it will be, that's got to include the world of work. That's number one. Number two, Revelation 22.5, right? We think of Revelation as kind of the end of this narrative. Heaven is the end. Revelation 22 is just the beginning because Revelation 22.5 tells us that we, you and me as human beings, will reign forever and ever with Christ on the new earth, which makes sense because that's exactly what we were created to do in Genesis 1. God's never wanted to do his work in this world on his own. He's always wanted to do it in partnership with other human beings. And the third passage I would point you to, Ali, is what I just mentioned, Isaiah 65. Go read the whole chapter. It's incredible. This incredible vision. It says that we are going to build houses on the new earth. We're going to plant vineyards and long enjoy the work of our hands. Our labor will not be in vain, right? So, it, but we can get, here's the deal. This is what's exciting to me in the present. We can get a taste of that right now. That not in vain language mm. that might sound familiar to a lot of our listeners. It's from a very famous verse in first Corinthians, first Corinthians 15, 58, where Paul says that any labor we do in the Lord today, in the Lord, basically meaning for his purposes and his glory and not our own is not in vain. Somehow, Making a latte, not for my glory, but for the glory of God and the good of others, is somehow not in vain. Somehow is going to contribute and shape our eternal future with God. That's mind-boggling. Yes, let's talk about that a little more because yeah. I've heard you say that one of the reasons why the seemingly mundane and the seemingly meaningless, so the diaper changes or yeah. the crunching numbers for a client or the waiting tables, one of the reasons that that is um, eternal, that that shapes eternity, that that matters in eternity is because it brings pleasure to God yes. and God's pleasure is eternal. So talk a little bit more about that. Oh man, I would love to. Thank you for giving me a chance to. So one of my favorite verses in all of scripture, because I, let me back up for a second. I think a lot of times in our modern context, Christians think that the only way we can bring pleasure to God is by going on a missions trip or sharing the gospel with our Praying, coworkers right. or giving money to our church. Psalm 37, 23 says that's a lie. It says that God delights in, quote, every detail, end quote, of the lives of the godly, it goes on mm. to say, right? Every single detail. Right. So now I can I can bring God pleasure when I'm making a latte or changing a diaper. Five quick ways we can bring God eternal pleasure in the mundane alley. Number one, we bring him pleasure when we obey his commands. Right. It's exactly what first John 3 22 says. We keep his commands and give him pleasure when he sees what we are doing. So if you make that latte without trying to exploit a customer, change that diaper, not begrudgingly, but thankfully that God has given you this child. That contributes to God's eternal pleasure. Number two, we bring him pleasure when we pursue excellence in all things. This is mm. the whole point of the parable of the talents, right? Come and share the master's happiness. Number three, we bring him pleasure, I think, by doing work that brings us pleasure. Because remember, Genesis 1, work was a gift he gave to us, right? And when I give gifts to my kids, I don't want them to play with them begrudgingly. I want them to enjoy them. So, Ali, you love your work. When you do your work and find joy in it and give praise to God for giving you that work, that brings him eternal pleasure. Two more quick ones. Number four, we bring him eternal pleasure by working with him and not just for him, mm -hmm. right? Not being so obsessed with God's mission in the world that we forget God himself and praying to him and being with him throughout the day. And then finally, I think we bring God eternal pleasure by just taking time to wonder at his work while we work. Wonder at the coincidences that helped us to land that deal. Wonder at the creative connections that God is making for us. Wonder at the raw materials he's given us. Like I keep coming back to a latte. I don't know why, right? Like the almonds that he's given me to make that latte. As we take time to wonder at those things, it brings him pleasure because he sees every detail of our lives and delights in the lives of the godly. Okay, so I don't have to tell you that the future is unsure. There's a lot of instability in the United States right now. And we just 
don't know what tomorrow is going to look like when it comes to inflation and when it comes to your own personal finances, when it comes to the supply chain. So you just need to make sure if things really hit the fan that you and your family are taken care of with your food supply. And that is why I am so glad to have my Patriot Supply as a sponsor of my show. Their three-month emergency food kit meets all of your nutritional needs should you one day need this kind of supply. If you go to my Patriot Supply or preparewithally.com, preparewithally.com, you save $200 and free shipping on this three-month emergency food kit. So go to preparewithally.com. Go ahead and have it. It's all. It's always better to be safe than sorry. Go to preparewithally.com. So doing your job, no matter what that job is, as long as it is not sin. Correct. Um, with joy, with excellence, with gratitude, with integrity, all yes. of these things bring God pleasure. God's pleasure is eternal and therefore doing our job well and in a way that honors the Lord is somehow in some kind of mysterious way eternal. It shapes yes. eternity. So every little thing we do, as you mentioned, every detail of the lives of the godly actually matters, not just in the here and the now, but forever. That's like, yeah. that's really significant. That's it's mind boggling. It, I could summarize it real tightly like this. Anything you do with excellence and love and in accordance with God's commands will shape the eternal pleasure of God. And what does that look like practically? I don't know. Here, here's one guess. We already talked about, we know there's going to be work on the new earth, right? We're going to be with Jesus literally on the new earth. I don't think it's crazy that one of the ways this will manifest itself physically is you're going to be working at your vocation on the new earth. Allie, what do you want to do on the new earth? You want to be podcasting? Oh, I, I don't know about that. I don't know <laughs> if I want to be podcasting. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I don't because I don't know exactly what it'll be like. Will I have a, a different gift? Will I Who finally knows? be able to sing? Who knows? Who knows? All right. So let's say you're singing on the new earth, mm -hmm. right? And Jesus comes up to you. Hebrews 610 tells us he remembers everything that we mm. do, right? And Jesus comes up to you and says, hey, Allie, I remember in the former age when you had an opportunity to embellish the truth in order to achieve goal X, Y, or Z, and you didn't do that. Mm. I saw that. I remember that act of faithfulness, and that brought the Father great pleasure, right? Mm. Like, that's, that's not out of the realm of wow. possibility. I think we can use our biblically formed imaginations to assume that that's one of the ways that this will literally shape eternity in our interactions with the risen Christ, right? Like, yeah. that should motivate us in the present to store up as many of those moments, those eternal moments as we possibly can, just by being faithful yeah. and excellent and loving in the present. And, you know, one thing we have a lot on this podcast or one thing we talk about a lot is testimony. So we have people who yeah. used to be atheists, used to have all different kinds of faith backgrounds, and they come to Christ. And one commonality that I find is that there was some moment that they interacted with someone and the other person who was a Christian or who played a, a role in this, it was a very commonplace or mundane thing for them to do. They placed a C.S. Lewis book on a table and left it there and didn't think about it. They looked in someone's eyes and said their name. Um, there's all kinds of these examples that I can think of that that person was simply doing the next right thing. And yes. typically it was a part of their job or being a student or something like that. And so I do also think biblically informed imagination that when we get to heaven, we will get to see all of those things that we did that we don't remember. Typically, we just talked to a stranger. We just asked someone how their day was going. We just took the time to like really listen to them and our job or whatever it was. And we will be able to see how God used that in the constellation of someone's testimony to be a step towards them coming to Christ. And so, I mean, and our no work doubt. is a part of that. Every detail 100%. is a part of that. I would argue our work is one of the primary ways that that happens. So we already talked, I, I think you know, Christians can assume the only way that work matters for eternity is when they make disciples. 
That's not true. We just saw that our work in and of itself brings God pleasure, but it certainly does matter to make disciples of all nations, to contribute to who is in heaven with us for eternity. I just read this fascinating study by Dr. Michael Green that found that uh, in the first three centuries of church history, when, when, when Christianity was exploding throughout the world, 80% of conversions to Christianity were not driven by a pastor. Hmm. We're not driven by a full-time missionary. 80% were led by what I call mere Christians Mm -hmm. going to work as tent makers and shepherds and mothers talking around the drinking well in their towns. That's how it happens. And that was true in the first three centuries. It's even more true today. I would argue when we are living in this increasingly quote unquote, post-Christian cultural moment, right? Our unbelieving friends are not going to walk into the four walls of a church to learn about Jesus for the first time. So where are they going to hear about him? By working shoulder to shoulder with you, listener, as you go to work and just faithfully represent your king. And that doesn't mean leaving Bible tracts all over your office necessarily, right? It's just doing your work with excellence and love. So excellent and so loving that people have to ask the question, what makes you different? To which the only answer is Jesus Christ. Yeah. You know, these days with so many options on the table, especially if you're graduating from college and you think that you have to have a high paying job that also fulfills all of your goals and your passions and also what you are uniquely good at. And that's kind of how we define calling. And if we don't find something that meets that, we constantly feel like we're settling and we feel like, well, we can't truly glorify God. We can't truly be happy until we find that one unique thing. And it breeds, I think, a lot of discontentment, a lot of anxiety in people when they haven't found that calling and they feel like they're just constantly in the waiting room of their own life. Um, Talk to us about that, about what calling is uh, vocationally from a biblical perspective. Yeah, this is a great question. I don't see a whole lot of evidence that calling is a noun. I think it's more of an adjective. Let me explain mm-hmm. what I mean by that. I think we have turned calling. We The church treats calling the way Hollywood treats marriage, right? Uh, Mr. Right, as if we are in a wild goose chase to find the one thing that God designed us to do. Here's the deal. I don't think God particularly cares what you choose to do for work in this life, so long as it's not out of line with his commands. I think he cares a lot about your heart as you discern what that thing is, right? But I don't think he's too concerned about the choice itself because guess what? Regardless of what you choose, his purposes will not be thwarted, see Job 42 too. He doesn't need you to take any particular job. He will find whoever he can to do whatever work needs to get done for the building of his kingdom. You and I just get to be grateful participants, right? And so I think that's incredibly freeing right? Now I could just make a choice. And I would argue, you know, the barometer for that shouldn't be our short-term happiness and our passions, quote unquote, before we start the work, but our giftings, right? Because the entire Christian life isn't about my happiness. It's about bringing happiness to others. And how do you do that? You do that through the ministry of excellence, right? We have fallen, Al, you and I are millennials. Every well-intentioned adult in our lives told us growing up, Do whatever makes you happy. Follow your passions. Follow your dreams. And we had more opportunity to do that than any generation before us. And yet Gallup tells us we're the least happy generation at work. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if Jesus knew what he was talking about when he said, hey, serve first. Don't seek to be served. Prioritize others' happiness above your own. And when we do, when we get really, really, really good at something, that's when I think that we find sustainable vocational joy for ourselves. All right, another break to tell you guys about Start Mail. So I know that you're probably still using those free inner, uh, those free uh, email services that are mining all of your data and all of your information and selling it to the highest bidder. That's why you get those services for free because you are the product that they are making money off of. But you don't have to worry about that with Start Mail. They care about your personal data. They care about your privacy. Start Mail is the perfect solution for protecting your privacy, giving you peace of mind. Their secure email service keeps your inbox 
box safe from unwanted spying eyes, protects you from spam. Every message can be encrypted or password protected. And when you delete an email, it's actually gone forever. You can use email aliases to keep your real identity hidden online. You can sign up today to save 50% on your first subscription year. Startmail.com slash Allie. Join the thousands of people who have chosen Startmail for their email security needs. That Startmail with a T. Startmail.com slash Allie for 50% off. Startmail.com slash Allie. And just because there are so many words today that have been misconstrued, uh, misconstrued and not in alignment with how scripture defines things. Of course, when we say happiness, we don't necessarily just mean making people feel good, although that can be good, but sometimes people feel good in a way that is, you know, not honoring to the Lord. So when we say Amen. bring others happiness, we are talking about seeking their well being as God defines it. And very often that does involve happiness, but of course, we as Christians are concerned about wholeness and holiness even before happiness. Um, yes. But your point absolutely stands. I talk about this a lot, how in this age of self-love, we're constantly told to find yourself, to seek yourself, and to seek only your own happiness, and everything else will fall into place. We seem really miserable. Like, we seem we to be really wallowing miserable. in anxiety. And like you said, it's almost like God knew that actually <laughs> we're not good gods for ourselves. When we right. worship ourselves, we actually end up really sad. Check this out. There's this brilliant researcher out of Yale. No idea whether or not she's a Christian. Her name is uh, Amy Resneski. Mm. She spent her whole career trying to understand what leads people to describe their work as a calling as opposed to a career or merely a job. And she studied it with doctors, computer programmers, administrative assistants, a bunch of different populations. And consistently, the number one predictor of someone describing their work as a calling is not whether or not they were excited about the work and passionate about the work before they started it. It's the number of years they have spent practicing the craft, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, you get to love what you do by getting really, really good at it and serving other people first. And again, this should not come as a surprise to Christ followers who model our lives after the one who came to serve and not to be served. But to your point, Allie, thank you for drawing out that nuance. It's not happiness necessarily. They were cultivating in others, right? Because that could be shallow. It could be unbiblical. It is service. The, 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 the guiding principle is what work can I do best in order to love my neighbor as myself? That's the guiding principle. Yes, I think that's absolutely true. And, and what, if, what if someone is a part of a job where they're the only Christian there and they're just yeah. in an unfair, inequitable workspace and yeah. their boss, their coworkers are constantly making things difficult, but say, you know, they don't, they don't have another option. It's not a simple job. It's just a really difficult job to do with joy. Yeah. How, how does a Christian navigate that? If that's where God has placed them right there, I mean, how did they do that to the glory of God? Oh man, this is a phenomenal question. I would encourage you um, now, listen, as you point out, if the job's causing you to sin, non-starter, you yeah. gotta leave. But I think those are like, those instances are very few and far between, right? And we kind of know he, them. Yeah. We kind of know them. Those are pretty easy, right? But man, if you're working in a dark place, I would encourage you to stay there, right? Because Jesus called us to be light. And where does light shine brightest? In really, really dark places. It's why we need more Christians in politics, more Christians in Hollywood, not retreating to build our own Christian subcultures. Although I, I, I like some of that content, I'm not condemning all that content, but we need to be running into the dark places because this is exactly what Jesus did, right? Hebrews 13 says that Jesus also suffered outside the city gates gate. And he's talking about the temple, right? So outside of the temple, outside the city gate. And there's a number of interpretations of this. Here, here's one that I think is really interesting. I think part of the application of this is J Jesus could have had a quote unquote holy job when he came to earth. It's perfectly within God's power to choose for Jesus to grow up as a priest, maybe a Pharisee, but instead Jesus worked outside the city gate as a carpenter 
working a regular J-O-B where I am sure he had more opportunities to be tempted, more opportunities to cheat out customers. We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses because Jesus worked in dark places outside the city gate. That should lead us to rush into those dark places to be a faithful presence, yeah. right? The one source of light and truth and imperfect holiness within that office. Yeah. And wow, it's getting really hard for Christians. It always has yes. been, of course, to a certain degree. And there are some instances, in especially when we're talking about gender and a lot of these issues that have come into the workplace where Christians are basically being called to lie. And of course, I would never condone a Christian lying or doing anything that is opposed to God's word. And I, I don't think, and you can tell me what you think about this, I don't think it's wrong for Christians to look for new opportunities but the point is that while you're there, you need to be there. Wherever you are, yes. be all there. That's what Jim Elliott said. And to seek um, the glory of God there because he might actually have you there, maybe for longer than you would want. And it's not just a waiting period. It's a period in which he is asking you to do work. That's exactly right. And all throughout scripture, we see examples of this, of God choosing people to go work in dark places. Obadiah essentially chief of staff to this evil king. Why was he there? To save the prophets, right? Yeah. Joseph going to work for this, what will become a very evil regime uh, in Egypt. Why? To do God's work of saving the people from famine, right? So time and time again, we see God choosing not to, choosing people not to go into safe spaces, right? But to go into dangerous places where his presence is most desperately needed. But you're right, Allie. You, if you're listening to this and you're working in a really tough situation, God may be calling you to leave, right? That is a very real possibility. And if he does, you got to go, but he might just as well be calling you to stay and just serve as a faithful, a, a faithful ambassador for your king. Okay, so you guys want to make sure that your savings are secure, right? Maybe that's one of your New Year's resolutions to make sure that you are managing your money well. Well, Birch Gold Group can help you do that. For over 5,000 years, gold has withstood inflation, geopolitical turmoil, and stock market crashes. And here's the great news. You can still get it. In fact, you can own gold and silver in a tax sheltered retirement account. Birch Gold makes it easy to convert an IRA or 401k into an IRA in precious metals. Just text the word Ally to 989-898 to claim your free info kit on gold. So if you're like, Ally, I have no idea what you're talking about what's an IRA, what's gold. You can get this free info kit and you can just learn more about it and see if it's right for you. Go to or text Ally to 989-898, Ally to 989-898. Okay, we only have a few minutes left. You've got a devotional, Word Before Work. Tell us what it looks like in the morning for a Christian to prioritize the word before work and how that can shape what we do. Yeah. So we've explored like a whole lot of truths real quickly in just a few minutes on this podcast, but it's not enough to learn these truths one time, right? We live at a time where every message is telling us that work is about our happiness and our joy, telling us to build our kingdoms rather than God's, right? And so we have got to be regularly steeping ourselves, renewing our minds with what God's word says, but our lives in general but I would argue our work really specifically. So that's why I wrote the word before work. It's the first Monday through Friday devotional I know of wow. that's narrowly focused on how God's word shapes your work. These are like uber short devotionals, right? You can read each of them in two minutes or listen to the audio book in about two minutes in your car on your way to work or in your lunch break. And the whole purpose is to renew your mind with what God said about your work and give you something bite-sized and actionable that you can do in a few minutes to help you make a greater eternal impact with the work you're doing today. Wow, that's so good. We did pack a lot into just a few minutes, <laughs> but you are excellent at explaining all of this and I can tell it's your passion. So I appreciate that. I, I want to end with, with this quote. Yeah. Um, from Elizabeth Elliot, and you can tell me what you think about it, but I think about it from time to time, just in the mundane or when I 
just don't feel like working. Don't feel like doing my job, whether it's my home job, my most important job as a wife and a mom, or whether it's this job. She said, this job has been given to me to do. Therefore, it is a gift. Therefore, it is a privilege. Therefore, it is an offering I may make to God. Therefore, it is to be done gladly if it is to be done for him. Here, not somewhere else, I may learn God's way. In this job, not in some other, God looks for faithfulness. I just love that. And I mean, that's exactly what you're saying. Exactly it. I, I would never try to say something better than Elizabeth Elliot. So well, just I would in. say you're you're right out there. You <laughs> articulated this so well. Where can people find you? How can they buy your many awesome books? Oh, let me say actually before I yeah. answer this, let me say I don't know if my producer Bree told you this, but the reason that you were booked is because she said that your book called to create changed her life, wow. um, and so you've had an impact on her, and then consequently on the show and on lots of people. So. Wow. Tell Tell, well, tell everyone where they hear. can, yeah, where they can find those books. Yeah, absolutely. So lots of books and lots of free content as well at jordanrainer.com, J-O-R-D-A-N-R-A-Y-N-O-R.com. And by the way, I know there's a lot of parents listening. Yes. Uh, we didn't talk about this book today, maybe some other time, but we are developing a whole series of children's books to embed these ideas in kids' minds at a very early age. We just launched an award-winning one last year called The Creator in You, which helps kids see that the sixth day of Genesis 1 was not the end of creation, contrary to how we typically preach it. Yeah. It was the beginning because it's when God passed the baton to us and told us to create and work like him uh, it's been an incredible resource for families that, frankly, I think has impacted a lot more parents than it has kids in its 387 words. Uh, that's another resource. And you can find all that at jordanrainer.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jordan. And yes, we'll have to have you on again. Lots of other things we could talk about, but encourage people to go to jordanrainer.com, check out all your books and all the resources you provide. Thank you so much. Thanks, Allie. 